Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 5, beginning with verse 27. <clears throat> and when they, this is the apostles, excuse me, they're talking about the apostles. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up. He was a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered, and this came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. All right, good morning. Good morning. We got a good crew in here today. I love that. Um, I hope you've seen some beautiful things this morning. I hope you've felt some beautiful things this morning. Uh, singing with Zion. Man, I tell you what, uh, he will sing. He was singing during a prayer earlier. And, uh, I love that. And some of us in this area uh, up here this morning can hear a guy having a blast in here right now with the kids. And that is awesome. That is awesome. And so if you don't know, uh, Ronnie's having the time of his life uh, helping out with the kiddos this month. And uh, we, I, I could hear several of us laughing up here. He's just so excited to be in here, uh, be over here with them. And so that's, that's just great. Um, you, we chose to be here today. And I'm, I'm glad to say we, because uh, I chose to be here and you chose to be here. I've got friends and guests here and all, all kinds of uh, people that I just love, and uh, thank you 
Thank you for that, and I mean that. Um, I'm glad that, that we're here together. We've been studying through Acts. So you, you may be here as a guest. You may be here for uh, the first time in a while. We've been studying through Acts. And so give me just a minute. To, uh, uh, some of you have been here the whole time, and you're in it. You know where we are. You know what's going on. But uh, occasionally I like to take a minute just to kind of r- remind everybody where we are. Um, there's, there's been a, a spirit-led, I, I believe, reason to, to all of this. Uh, back in 2020, I started working through the prophets. Some of y'all probably don't remember that. You may not remember anything I said back, back in that year. But we started working through the prophets, and that gave me a lot of good things to consider during some pretty odd times. And so we worked through the prophets, and uh, we actually took a minute and skipped into uh, or, or, or used Ezra Nehemiah to, to, to kind of rebuild the temple and get us back into a, you know, a, a, I don't know, a church gathering mindset, perhaps. And that was really good. We, we did that series under the... Uh, pavilion next door if you remember that we were outside and um, then we started wrapping up the prophets again and Malachi was a prophet during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah and so we dug into Malachi and uh, I wanted to keep going after Malachi and uh, you 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 may not remember this but uh, Malachi uh, ends with a uh, with a with a verse that I really loved and in fact I wanted to read some of that and so bear with me today I'm going to I'm going to, uh, might jump around a little bit, but, but just to help us remember, uh, Malachi ends with a really incredible chapter, I think. This is chapter 4. Uh, Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and evildoer will be chaff. The day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will Leave them neither root nor branch. Are you following me? This is prophecy now. This is around 500 years before Jesus. The day is coming. Um, I've been that arrogant evildoer. And uh, that doesn't look good for me. But, verse 2, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Some of you are here the Sunday that I got about as technical as I ever could, and I put a video on the screen of calves skipping. Um, you probably won't ever see that again, by the way, but, uh, but that one Sunday it worked out. You will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked. They will be ashes under your soles, under the soles of your feet on that day which I am preparing. Verse 4, remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I have commanded him in Horeb, For all Israel, behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet coming before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Prophecy can be tough sometimes. Um, It's tough for me. It can be hard to decipher. Thankfully, Luke used that one. I I think Luke must have been a student of Malachi, like many of the Jews were, and he decided to put portions of that scripture, portions of this prophecy, in the Gospel of Luke. And so you jump some 500 years later, you know, to the time of Jesus, and these are things that Luke wrote, and this ought to sound familiar to you. Uh, Let's see, in verse 13 of chapter 1 of Luke... This is when an angel of the Lord is revealing to Zacharias that he's going to have a a son named John that we call John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. Your petition has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness. Luke liked those words, joy and gladness. Many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And it will be he who, as a forerunner before him, and the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Does that sound familiar? Where did Luke get that? From Malachi, right? And then, and then you flip over. I could keep reading. This is so, guys, the Bible's cool. Have I said that in a while? This is really cool. 
You flip over later in chapter 1 and Luke does it again. Verse 76, this is Zacharias praising God for what's happened through John as a forerunner of Jesus. This is 76 of chapter 1. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go on before the Lord to prepare His ways to give to His people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. That's our Gospel. Because of the because of the tender mercy of our God. Forgiveness of sins because of the mercy of God. You see that? With which the sunrise from on high will visit us. Cool. Man, if you're into this stuff, guys, it'll change you. You will marvel at the beauty of this book, its inspiration, and the wonder of its author. Again, so that was the reason. Are you following me? We were, this is back from 2020. We were prophets. And Ezra and Nehemiah. And Malachi is a, a prophet during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we get back into Malachi. And then we get down with Malachi and we're waiting for a Savior, right? We're waiting for the promises of the prophets to be fulfilled. And Malachi uses this language that Luke picks up on. And so where are we going to go? Where, I mean, obviously, let's go to Luke. And then we worked through Luke for a couple years, and now Luke also wrote Acts as part two of Luke, and so we're into Acts, and here we are today. Uh, Sam, I always appreciate, man, uh, moving today, uh, getting to share this space and, and worship with the guys who get up here and lead. Uh, Sam, you said God's been planning this day from way back, I don't, wherever you are, brother, and uh, yeah, he's planned every day from way back, and uh, it's really good, really good. So anyway, that's where we are. Uh, Christians believe, okay? Christians believe that Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Malachi. I like reminding myself what we believe and reminding us what we believe. Christians believe that Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Malachi. That through him, the arrogant will be set ablaze. My arrogance will be set ablaze. That if I live an arrogant and evil life, then my legacy will end. I will have no root or branch. But, for those who revere God, healing will come from the Son of Righteousness. And we will skip about like calves from the stall. Restoration will come. A great day for those who obey. A terrible day if I refuse. Again, Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Malachi. That's what Christians believe. Jesus called this fulfillment, I think his favorite way to put it, was the coming of the kingdom of God. I want that language to just be so familiar to us. Jesus called it the coming of the kingdom. Okay, he believed, I've said this a lot, and I want to say it a lot more. Jesus believed that his kingdom was inaugurated with His resurrection and ascension. When He went and sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, that's biblical language. We see it everywhere. He believed that inaugurated this kingdom of God. And he, will, he, he commissioned us, His people, to live it out until one day when it's consummated. Okay? Until one day when it's perfected for all of eternity. And that day will be when He returns. I... I use this language a lot. I love it. This, this already kingdom, but not yet. It's already, but it's not yet. Isn't that wonderful to think about? Truly wonderful to think about. And so guys, Acts is about this in-between time. It's about this period of living out the kingdom way. These, these apostles are inspired by God. Okay, they, 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 The Spirit of God lives within them. And they're living out this kingdom way. And we're invited to live it out too. That's where we are. And it's wonderful. It's, it's a great place to be, uh, to see how we are to be Acts and Old Union. How are we to live this out? That's what we've been doing. So welcome to these studies. If it's your first time, we're in chapter 5. You can open up to chapter 5, and you don't have to listen to me if you don't want. Just read it a whole bunch and figure it out. You'll be just fine doing that, okay? But, um, but I, I, I'll talk about it a little bit during this time we have together. The great irony of this chapter, 
the great irony of really just the kingdom of God is that so often those who thought they had it all figured out didn't. And I've got to be so careful with that. I've spent much of my life thinking I have everything figured out. And again, the great irony of, of this kingdom is that Jesus perplexed those who thought they had it all figured out. And so the irony of this chapter especially is the ones who, again, they, they were the leaders among the Jews. Uh, Jesus comes and he, he says, no, you've got to reconsider how you've been doing things. And so I need to hear that. I want us to hear that. Again, those who thought they were right had been wrong. They thought they had been obeying God, following His Word, but they had missed the Word. They had missed the heart of God. Guys, the Word of God, um, it's more than any command. It's more. It's more than any precept. It's more than any rule. It's more. And, and uh, I have been so blessed to grow into that understanding. I want us as a people to grow into that understanding. I didn't know what Ronnie was going to read this morning, but I had to tab that one. Man, that's, Paul was all over it in Galatians 3. I'm thankful for that. Uh, John 1. I've tried to make much of John 1 and uh, Hebrews 1 while I've been here. Um, John 1 is so important for us as a people. That the, the Word of God, right, is the Word that became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His image. Image as the only begotten Son of God. Again, the Word is more than any command and precept. And guys, we will mess up. I have messed up. And I will continue to mess up if I read these words without knowing the Word. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. I like to remind people of that. You got it for me next up there, Halston. Um, I can, I, sometimes I make these things for you and sometimes I don't. Uh, they always take care of me up there in, in the box. And I appreciate you, buddy. And so, um, Hebrews 1. I always try to remind us of Hebrews 1. Where do we see the perfect, the exact representation of God? Where do we see His nature? The uh, perfect representation of His nature and characteristics. Where do we see it, church? In Jesus. That's Hebrews 1. Again, so you will understand Acts chapter 5 better when you realize that it'll, 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 it'll affect you more when you realize that these were people who, who were using this book. Not all of it. They, had, they didn't have the portions that we have. But they were using it and they thought they had God so nailed down, but they didn't. Again, they had missed the Word. John 1. Hebrews 1. Okay? Um, I wanted to read Hebrews 1, if you don't mind. Um, you're, you're hanging with me this morning. I really appreciate it. This, this means something to me, you guys. And uh, I told you last week, if you, if you let it, if you let it, it'll change you. If you let it. Hebrews 1. <clears throat> God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in, what's your say? His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. Whew, that confounds me. I sure do like it though. He, who's that He? His Son, is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. Isn't that cool? So, so where do we best see God? Through who? Through Jesus. That's it. The radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, and He upholds all things by the word of His power. 
confound, confounded again. But I love thinking about that. When he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'll stop there, but guys, that's good. Jesus made purification for our sins. And he now sits in authority at the right hand of God. Um, that's our gospel, by the way. That's our gospel. My arrogance will hate that gospel. My arrogance hates it because Jesus making purification for my sins means that I'm a sinner. It means that I'm not okay. It means that I've got to be very honest with myself and admit things that aren't good. It means that I've got to humble myself. It means that I've got to look at my brother and not be so judgmental and not call out the speck in his eye when I've got the log in my own. You see, that, that gospel will make an arrogant, evil heart angry. But if you'll let that break you down, if you'll let it, if you'll, if, if you'll let it tear you open, as we'll see today, it'll change you. I am blessed to say in utter sincerity that that is what I want for us. It's a blessing to get to say that. That's what I want for us. So anyway, <clears throat> we're in Acts. And unfortunately, in Acts 5, uh, the people who would not let it tear them down were these Sadducees. Uh, the high priest and his associates, these religious leaders <clears throat> that we call the Sadducees in Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> and I've talked about them a lot. I won't spend a lot more time detailing them for you. You can study the Sadducees. I think it's okay to think of them as a denomination of the Jews. We understand that word denomination, right? And so I think we could best understand Sadducees, Pharisees, others as a denomination of the Jews, okay? Okay. Um, Christianity in its early days was kind of like a denomination of the Jews, by the way, too. And that, that needs to challenge us a little bit, okay? Uh, I invite you to be challenged by that wording. Uh, the earliest Christians in Acts, they didn't just stop being Jews. And I think I've mentioned that. That's why we see a lot of these Jewish practices continue. That's why we often find them in the temple. We're going to read all through Acts and study it. And we're going to see Christians doing very Jewish things. And it'll, it'll help you understand this if you realize that the day of Pentecost, they didn't just stop being Jews, okay? They became Jews who believed that their law had been fulfilled in who? Jesus. That Jesus was their Messiah, okay? And, and that's exactly what Jesus had proclaimed. Um, we make much of the Sermon on the Mount here. Welcome to Old Union. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Okay? Let's read it a lot. A few years ago, we, we read it every day for 40 days. In Matthew chapter 5, you remember what Jesus said? This is good. I told you I'd skip a little bit. You can stay in Acts 5 and just listen if you want. But in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to, do some of you know, fulfill. You remember that? For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or strokes shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Confounding a little bit there. I invite you uh, to ponder that. I really want you to focus on what he said next, though. You ready for this? He said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees, and I think I could add Sadducees to that, they, they made much of the law. They, they were very strict in their interpretation of the law. And, and Jesus has just said that the law is important. He says, yet... Our righteousness must surpass this legal strictness. You've got to read the Sermon on the Mount over and over and over again. Notice what he did next. He would quote portions of the law. You have heard that it is said, 
you shall not, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. But then he would what? He would take it even a step further and he would dig into the heart of these laws. Okay, the heart that has never changed, that will never change. Isn't this great? Again, I invite you to ponder on those things with me. We'll get back to that a little bit here. Uh, but um, again, the Sadducees, back in Acts chapter 5, they were those who refused Jesus as the Messiah. They refused Him as the fulfillment of the law on the grounds that their Scripture was it. Their Scripture was right. He was wrong. The Torah, okay, for the Sadducees, the Torah, the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, was the authority. Jesus was not the authority. The Torah is the authority. Okay? And, 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 and again, I, I invite us into this. I, I have invited myself into this. I don't want to be like these Sadducees. I don't want to use this book like they use the Torah and miss Jesus. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? I hope. I don't, I don't want to use this book like they use the Torah and then miss Jesus. And we are tempted to do that. To use this holy book apart from Jesus. We're tempted to use this holy book but not look like our Lord. To use this holy book but not follow His way. To not love like Him. And live like Him. Share like Him. This is serious to me. I want it to be serious to us. It reminded me of John 8 this week. Okay, again. Lots of thoughts in my mind today. We'll get in Acts chapter 5. It may not be the last... Sunday of Acts chapter 5. Okay. You remember what happened in John chapter 8? This is really good, you guys. It's about Jesus today. I hope you see it. You probably know this story. John chapter 8. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, a place He would go oftentimes to find peace. Well, early in the morning, He came again into the temple. And all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. Can you picture that? He's in the temple complex, and he's teaching, just like his apostles would do later. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now the law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? Well, they were saying this, testing him. That, he might have, that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But they persisted in asking him, and he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, he and the woman, where she was, in the center of the court. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did, they not, did, did, did no one condemn you? She said, Lord, no one. And he said, now, now notice this, I do not condemn you either. But then what did he say? But from now on go and what? And sin no more. I don't have much to say about that, but I want you to hear these words. Jesus did not condone sin, and neither were his followers. But he always challenged the heart of the one who wanted to condemn the sinner. He didn't condone sin. We won't either. We can't. But the heart of the one that wants to condemn that sinner, Jesus challenged every time. You see, we can, we can use the law and get number one right. We can, we can study the words and do number one. But if we miss the word, then we might be the one that Jesus is condemning. We might be the one that Jesus is challenging. 
if we miss the Word, the Word. What's the Word? John 1, Hebrews 1, right? Everything that Jesus taught and said about Him being the Word, the way, the life. Okay? He condoned no sin, but He called into question our heart when we wanted to condemn the sinner. Do you want to condemn others? I'm going to ask me, Stephen, think about the times in your life when you've wanted to condemn someone so that you're proven right. Guilty. I've been there. The times in my life when I've wanted to condemn someone, why? To prove that I'm right. To prove that they're wrong. That's not okay. Father, forgive me. Forgive us. Or have I wanted to, 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 to stop sin because I believe that God's way is the way of life. There it is. God's way is the way of life. This isn't okay. Let's, let's rethink what we're doing here. There it is. There it is. Again, Jesus would quote Torah. I mentioned this earlier. Right? Don't commit murder. You've heard it said, but I'm telling you, that anger in your heart, you're killing your brother with that anger in your heart. Don't commit adultery. Jesus talked a lot about this. Don't commit adultery. But I'm telling you, guys, when you're, when you're lusting, you're already committing adultery in your heart. You see what Jesus is doing there? Again, I've tried to help us see, and I hope I have, I've tried to help us see why Jesus' teaching infuriated these people, and I hope you're seeing that with me. He threatened their control. We've talked about that. He, he believed differently than them. They believe, he believed in resurrection. He believed that God works among humans. They didn't believe that. But he taught as one with authority over the Torah, and they wouldn't have that. Okay? All right, back to the story before the, the kids interrupt us before I even get going, right? Back to the story, Acts chapter 5. I appreciate uh, my dad's reading just a moment ago. <clears throat> All right. Jesus had been killed by those like the Sadducees. They are the ones who put him on a cross, okay? Or had the Romans put him on a cross. However, you need to see that. But he had resurrected and ascended to the Father, and he had commissioned his disciples to live out this kingdom. I talked about that. All right, and the disciples did. They proclaimed this kingdom, and the Sadducees opposed it. Okay, we're at the point in the story where the Sadducees had thrown them in prison, and an angel of the Lord had released them. And that's really cool. Read Acts chapter 5, and I think God kind of has a sense of humor. Uh, when we read that story. I, I really like it. It befuddled them. We put them in jail, but they're not there. Well, there they are. And so that's a good one. I hope you read that. They were befuddled and they said this in verse 28. The apostles are back and they're teaching just like they were before they were imprisoned. And then in verse 28, the Sadducees, the high court, the council, there's more than just Sadducees, but the Sadducees are kind of leading the charge in this chapter. All right. They say in verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in His name. Yet, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, I tried to really help us see that last week. Uh, I need the blood of Christ. I need it. And, and, and if you're sitting here today and you think you have no sin then your words are similar to these Sadducees. We're not, we're not guilty of His blood. We don't need that blood on us. No, I need the blood of Christ. They didn't want the blood of Christ. They didn't think too much of that. Again, humble. Admission of sin. I'm not okay. I'll never be okay without Jesus, church. My arrogance makes me dangerously resemble these men, and I don't like that. I don't want that. Jesus surprised the religious world. I want Him to surprise me. Like This is, what, this is how the apostles responded. Uh, you can mark this in your Bible if you'd like, as just 
um, the gospel. It's, it's spoken very quickly, very concisely. I often tell you guys to mark places of the gospel. Um, sometimes I, I think we might have been confused about what the gospel is. Maybe we've spent time memorizing how we believe it best to respond to. Um, but I challenge you to really know the gospel. And the best place to see the gospel is in Scripture. This is it. This is really good. You ready? The response. Peter and the apostles answered this charge from the Pharisee, the Sadducees. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging Him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to His right hand. There's that language. As a prince. He has the authority as a prince, and also He's a what? A Savior. To grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. By the way, who grants repentance? This is cool. Who grants repentance? Jesus. By the way, who grants forgiveness of sins? Jesus. And so I will caution us against any kind of thinking that, that, that we earn repentance, that we earn forgiveness. Caution. That's not our Gospel. Our Gospel is that repentance and forgiveness of sins is made possible through whom? Jesus. Amen, church. That's good language. He is the one whom God exalted. He is the one whom God has made prince and Savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Man, what a Gospel. Um, how do you think that made the Sadducees feel? Yeah, you, yeah right. Like, I hope they had their still toes on for that one. Right? They, they were offended terribly by it. And, and so I enjoyed looking at it and, and, and just thinking, why were they offended? Um, we must obey God rather than men. What did that insinuate to the Sadducees? That they weren't obeying what? God. What do you, what do you mean we're not obeying God? We, we, we're the people of the Torah. Like, what, what, what do you mean? Do you, you see how this must have made them feel? Um, there's a lot I could... I could pluck that verse out of its context and use it in a lot of different ways. We must obey God rather than men. And there's a lot of cool ways that that could be used. Rightfully could be used. But again, in this context, Peter is saying this to the Sadducees, insinuating, you think you got it, but you don't. The God of our fathers. Notice that line. He's indicating to them that, that the God who has always been who has never changed, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who you revere, that God has appointed who? Has approved who? Jesus. And so not only are you going against the God you believe in, but you're going against your fathers. Again, think about, think about their blood pressure at this point. Okay? Uh, he, he doesn't stop. You, you, you know, Peter, light up, lighten up a little bit here, brother. Like, come on, they're going to kill you. Uh, uh, whom you put to death. Okay, so you're not obeying God. Um, I'm just trying to think how this would have... I've, I've been a Sadducee. Like, I'm, I'm not obeying God. And the God of... I'm going against my fathers. And I, and I am guilty for putting Jesus to death. That one was pretty plain, isn't it? Who, oh, by the way, you put him to death. He is the one whom God exalted as prince and savior. Prince, again, this idea of ruler, like authority. Savior, you need him. You put him to death and you don't, you don't like him, you don't believe in him, but you need him. He has the authority and you need him because you need to repent and be forgiven. Uh, again, I, I didn't study terribly much about the Sadducees. I did, I guess, compar comparatively to some others. I'm no Sadducee scholar. But I understand the Sadducees to have thought that they could accomplish um, much of their position with God through their own work. And boy, can I identify with that. They were a group of people who neglected God's divine work in their life. Again, I can identify 
for Peter to be telling them, look, you need a Savior. You have to have Him. Again, imagine how that made them feel. And then to wrap it up, he says, the Holy Spirit is witness to all of this whom God gives to those who obey Him. Insinuating once again, what? You don't have Him. You don't have the Holy Spirit. Now how do you think they're going to respond to this? Well, we see it, don't we? Look in the next verse. When they heard this, they were what? They were cut to the quick. Well, no duh. And they what? Did what they did to Jesus. They intended to kill him. To kill them, rather. Uh, cut to the quick gets me. I like that phrase. That's in my New American Standard 95 that I usually use when I'm up here. Your translations have different wordings. Cut to the heart, some of yours may say. Uh, infuriated. Uh, enraged. I think I came across a few times. Okay. Um, Greek is cool. I am no scholar. Uh, I had a good teacher one time that said, use Greek to just paint pictures. Okay. The, the picture of the ancient word here, the original word, is one of your mind being sawn in two. That's the picture. And so, and so what, what, what idiom would we use in, Amer in 21st century English today? Your mind is just split. I was thinking like, you know, like, like you, you just blew my mind. You know? Um, it, it's, it's literally, the word here means sawn or torn with your teeth in two in reference to their mind. They had no compartment. They, they, they had no capacity for coping with what they were hearing from these apostles. Okay? And because they had no capacity for coping with what they were hearing, what, what was their only response? To flip out. Right? That was it. To flip out. And so, we're killing you guys. That's the flip. You see that? Now, I told you last week, and I mean this, if you care, if you're listening, if you're zoned out, then you're out. Like, see you at lunch in here in just a minute. If you're listening to this and you care about this gospel, there's two ways you respond to it. Okay? Because it's calling us to, to repent. It's calling us guilty. And if you're calling me guilty, and I don't think I'm guilty, guess what I'm going to get? Mad. I'm going to flip. All right? But if you're calling me guilty and that's, and that's breaking down my heart, then what am I going to do? I'm going to be, okay, well, well what? I'll give you an, we see this language cut to the quick or cut to the heart somewhere else. Look in Acts 2.37. Okay, you keep, it, so, so just, if, if you're writing your Bibles, th this will be helpful. Note. Acts 5.33, and compare it with Acts 2.37. What happened when, when the, the mind of those was blown, was split, was rent, was torn? In Acts 2 at Pentecost, when they realized they had killed the, the Messiah, what happened there? They didn't have capacity to cope with that either. And so their response is, well, what can we do? I've, I have messed up so bad. I have messed this over so bad. I look back on my life. I look back to this day. My arrogant thoughts. My evil actions. My anger. My, 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 my desire to one-up people. My sins. All of it. I'm cut. What can I do? What's the response that day? Repent. Repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the purification, the remission of your sins, and what? Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's one way to respond this morning. And, and what's the other way? I got no compartment to handle this. I reject this message. I reject it. And I'm mad that you dare to even speak it. Okay? Guys, I really, 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 did I say that? Really, like, I really want us to be Acts 2.37 in here. I don't want us to be so, 
I don't want us to be Acts 5.33 and think we got all this figured out when we hear this gospel. I want us to be Acts 2.37 and be open, be thoughtful, be curious, right? And that's what we see here. Um, that's the contrast we see here. Be slow. Be thoughtful. Maybe these words are to Stephen. Maybe they are to me. Maybe it's not just a story that I read and preach at everyone else. Maybe this is to me. Okay? Um, they're ready. And so I'll try to wrap some of this up quickly. Really like that song, Tyler. And it fits in uh, to where we'll try to wrap up here in just a minute. I think it might be, oh man, don't you love when things like that work out. We're going to bring the kids in one more time. <clears throat> Hide me now under your wings, cover me within your mighty hand. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know his power in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know you are God. Here's the thing, you guys. Um, So uh, what comes, what's going to come after you humble yourself and you follow Jesus? Um, it's going to make people mad. And uh, the Bible speaks a lot to that. The suffering of Christians and... Uh, how much it's going to hurt to follow Him. Um, this was really cool to me, and so uh, I think I got everything all figured out, right? And uh, sometimes you think you know how people are going to act and how people are going to behave. You write them off because you think, ah, oh, that's just the way they are. You know who stands up, or who kind of stands up for the apostles here? A pretty unlikely character, you know? Uh, one of those guys who had made a lot of the law, too. He was a Pharisee, a little different than a Sadducee, a lot different in some ways, but his name is Gamaliel. And uh, maybe we don't talk about him a lot, maybe we should. Uh, might sound familiar, he, was, he had a student we'll meet later in this book of Acts whose name is Saul of Tarsus. I loved thinking about how maybe it was some of the heart of Gamaliel that opened up Saul's heart to know Jesus. 
Gamaliel had to be a, a pretty torn individual. No doubt he believed that the power of God was in this book that he had dedicated his life to, and all of a sudden, there's this guy that's challenging all of it. And uh, maybe I haven't said this enough, but when you start to think that, that hurts a little bit. When you realize you've, uh, you've put so much of yourself into something, but you've missed the heart of it. So I don't know, I don't want um, to write too much into Gamaliel that I don't know. But what he did that day, and I'll be quick and might get back to this next week, he stood up, and it, and it, and it had to be risky, but he stood up and he said, time out, court, time out, Sadducees. Um, and then to paraphrase, you read it, to paraphrase, he said, let's just let God be God here. Let's just be still. And let's back up and let's trust that God's going to be God. Because if we, if we react in, in quickly, if we react in our anger, if we react when our mind is blown and we do things, we, we might in fact be fighting against God. That's what Gamaliel says. And so he says, guys, just time out for just a minute. Just back up. I'm so thankful uh, for this unlikely individual, this Pharisee, who reminds the Sadducees that God is in control. Let's let Him be God. And uh, you can read uh, what he said more. I'm going to skip that portion for now. Verse 38 of chapter 5, So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men, leave them alone, if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. I love these words, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. I don't have much more to say about that this morning. I just need to hear that. Just be still and let God be God. Well, the council took his advice. Look at verse 40. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. All right, well, we'll, we'll listen to you, Gamaliel, but we're at least going to beat them up. Okay? And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, which, eh, kind of going in circles there, I guess. And so the apostles went on their way, verse 41, from the presence of the council, and here it is, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I love that. Boy, I'm thankful that that's there. I have never been beat up for following Jesus. I've got some stories I could tell you where it, that, that, would, intru that uh, would be kind of interesting to you, I'm sure. I've been called stupid a few times, which that ain't beat up, but still, that... That, that was uh, interesting. and uh, I've never been beat up for following Jesus. And uh, I was thinking about this. I wanted to share it with you. You know, you know maybe why God has kept me from being beat up from following Jesus? Maybe He's kept me from that because I don't know if I could respond like them. I don't know if I'd have it in me to rejoice being thought worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. But man, I want to get there. And I invite us to get there like, uh, I think I've said this a few times, guys, whatever you get up, give up for Jesus, whatever you give up for following Him, whatever you lose for following Jesus is worth it. It's worth it. And, and I don't know if I understand that uh, yet, but I, but I believe it. I believe that He's worth it. Um. Get a little personal with you, if you don't mind. So, uh, I don't, uh, I don't say this for any reason other than had a good day yesterday. Uh, my sister, who was born with her legs turned inside, uh, call it club-footed. Uh, she invited me to run in a in a race with her yesterday. And so uh, we, we started the race together, then I just took off, and she just, you know. But um, 
I've, I've never felt as good running for a distance as I had yesterday. It just felt good. And, and she inspired me a little bit, and I was thinking about a lot of other things, a lot about Jesus, a lot about, uh, a lot about Jesus and about some of you guys. You know, um, running is funny because it hurts, and uh, people choose to do it. So you think, why would people choose to do something that hurts? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And uh, my sister was a good reason yesterday and a lot of other things. There was a time yesterday I was running through um, some pictures of um, soldiers who had died uh, fighting for what they believe in. And I was thinking, for that mile, it wasn't hard to run, you know. It wasn't hard to run. There was a, a portion of that race where you're running... And it's a, it's a saint. This always gets me worked up. It's a St. Jude race. And there's portions of it where you're running and you see kids who, who had been in the hospital. But then you see pictures of them a few years later as they've been healed and as they're living their life. And it wasn't hard to run through that, you know. Your mind goes from that suffering and it goes into thankfulness that you're getting to run when others aren't. I share that with you because that's kind of silly, really, to think about choosing to run like that, maybe, and comparing it to choosing to follow Jesus. But I really think there is there's a way to understand this gospel. Well, guys, you'll choose to suffer because Jesus is worth it. You'll, you'll choose to follow Him even if it means giving up stuff that you have loved. Uh, you'll choose to be His disciple even if nobody wants to do it with you because He's worth it. And that moves me a lot, but then what really moves me is when I think about how He suffered believing that we are worth it. God is inviting you to follow Him this morning. To humble yourself and live for something that is worth it. And I wish you would. We'll stand and sing for your encouragement.